the end of the day, it is your story. It's what you want to be known for. And, and you have control of that. On this week's episode, I speak with a new connection, Wayne Partello, who actually was introduced to me from a high school friend, my friend Katrina, who I used to take to school every day in my sweet 1989 red Toyota Celica. And so she connected me with Wayne and we had a great conversation where we talked through his journey and how he got to where he is now with a successful business that he has just started a couple years ago. And a lot of our conversation talks about achieving success without taking the traditional college route and then having the ability to reevaluate your career path when you get to a certain point and you feel like you've achieved everything and thinking what's next or what can I do next that will serve the purpose or meet particular goals. And of course, I bring in a lot of the questions about society and how those pressures we have growing up when we see our peers doing other things, what does that drive us to do? Or should we lean into those? Should we go against them? So it was a really interesting conversation and it was great to get to know Wayne in this way. So I hope you enjoyed this week's episode with Wayne. Before we jump into it, I just want to say thank you to those of you that have signed up for the Patreon. How exciting. I have a handful of people now that are helping to support the show and, and help offset some of the financial costs of doing the show. So I do want to thank my particular sponsors, which are two of the tiers on Patreon. My friend Mickey, who wants me to refer to her as goddess. And my best friend Tracy is supporting the show as well. My friend Emily, who told me not to say her name. Sari and Brian are also supporters of the show. So thank you so much to all of you. If you want to see what we're doing over on the Patreon feed, where ad-free episodes, bonus episodes with former guests have started to roll out. There is a sneak peek in the public feed. Other things that I come up with or people request will be on the Patreon. And I'm just so excited to get that launched and start to build it with my supporters. So thank you so much. And without further ado, here's the episode with Wayne Partello. I'm Mackil Hooley, and this is The Life Shift. Candid conversations about the pivotal moments that have changed lives forever. Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Life Shift podcast. I am here with a new connection, Wayne Partello. Thanks for joining me, Wayne. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited. So this is going to be an interesting one for me. Uh, I do typically come into these conversations without knowing too much about the story, but this this one will be very, very new because we don't know each other. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> so we have a mutual friend who recommended that we get in connection and and have Wayne on the Life Shift podcast to talk about kind of what I think so many people in America and probably across the world maybe are itching to do, you know, and and start something of their own. So I won't give away too much, but maybe you can give us a little bit about who you are right now, and then we'll kind of paint the picture of what your life was like before that shift. Sure. Yeah. So uh, Wayne Partello, I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of Quento Marketing. Uh, we are a marketing and brand consultancy based in San Diego, California, but we've got folks all over the country living where they want to live and working where they want to work. We help brands determine who they want to be. And then we have a full service of marketing skills behind us to help bring that, you know, that story to life. So Quento means story in Spanish. And we try to, I try to simplify things in life. And so boiling and simplifying brand, which was this buzzword and, you know, people get caught up in it and just confused by it, simplifying it down to just story and, and helping people understand that at the end of the day, it is your story. It's what you want to be known for and, and you have control of that. And so I think working with people and brands to help them outline what they're working for and, and make decisions with purpose. The things that we did on the business side, I started to apply to my own life and and did the same thing. You know, before we get into it, I was just watching, you have a video on your LinkedIn company page, kind of just a little introduction of, of why you exist. And I teach at a local university here in Orlando, and I teach a personal branding class or, you know, like an introduction almost just kind of it's early in their program. They don't really know exactly what they want to be yet. 
But everything you said that in that video was like, hmm, maybe I should just play this video in my <laughs> class because we tell them like, what do you want to be known for? Like if someone says your name and, and it can relate to a business brand. So it was funny that I had that connection because like we literally say that to the students, like you're all graduating with the same degree, right? Or, you know, you're your company, there's a million of you. So how do you set yourself apart? If someone says your name, what's the story that's behind it? What are you known for? And that was a big part of, of my career was I was known for some things and it, it helped me a ton. And um, I needed to figure out how to apply that to, to, to waking up every day, doing what I actually wanted to do every day. I think it's hard, especially probably for like my generation where much of my like growing up, we were told kind of like it was almost like prescribed what we had to do, right? You graduate from high school, you're 18, you must pick your future career at that point in time, right? Like who knows it's crazy. what to do, right? And so it's 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 nice seeing younger people now, like in my space that can actually dream and do the thing. Not that we couldn't back then, but it felt very much like you just had to meet the check marks. It was, that was life in the nineties, you know, yeah. like you just, you know, graduate, get a good job, get promoted, do all these things. So I'm assuming that's kind of what your career was like leading up to this. Yeah. It was actually very different. Yeah. So I, I, yeah. So I, Coming out of high school, I was young, so I was only seventeen when I graduated. I was the youngest, one of the like two youngest kids in my in my class. And my dad, it was really important to him that I had a plan for because I wasn't a great student. I hated school. The only thing I enjoyed doing, we had a TV studio in the, in the high school. I enjoyed editing, and so I enjoyed producing um, content. I, at fourteen, I was already editing and and working in production, so local access, that type of stuff, high school sports, but. I was dead set that I was going to become a police officer. So in the town that I grew up in, you know, you were going to be a policeman, a fireman, an electrician, a plumber, you know, you, you, all of these amazing jobs, which I wanted to be a policeman. I love the show Chips on TV when I was a kid. And I, I also enjoyed motorcycles. So I was like, I want a motorcycle. That'd be amazing. So I came out, I had to come up with a plan. I was actually going to go in the military. I didn't get in with my ankle uh, situation. So that didn't work. And then all my friends were going to college and I didn't have a plan of how I was going to apply that. So I didn't go to college. I, I joked that my parents were really young when they had me. So I don't think they were constrained by the same societal pressures as everybody else that I grew up with, where their parents were in this friend group where it was really important. Like my parents didn't even know what the SATs were at that point. Right. So I heard about this test at school and was like, Hey, am I supposed to take this test? And like, oh, I don't know. And so I literally showed up that day and signed up and went in and just took the test. Like I had no prep courses, no nothing. And it was just, school was never my thing. It's funny. Now I have little kids and I talk to them about it and I'm like, it just, it never clicked for me. And, and, like, and my wife is a, was a teacher. So like school was everything. My, 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 my middle sister, same thing. Book, school, straight A student, loved learning that way. I love learning, but it wasn't acceptable to learn the way that I like to learn back then. Was it like learning by doing? Yeah, it was like, oh, this is incredible. I could do this. So anyways, uh, yeah, so it was a little bit of a different path. It's interesting to it's interesting to hear that too, because I almost see it as you tell the story about your parents, you know, not necessarily having that checklist that a lot of us had with our parents. It's almost like a blessing because it gives you that freedom to do whatever the hell you want. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was a plan, right? Put a plan together of well, how you're going to be successful, like what what you, how are you going to apply it? So you're okay. So you know we're going to pay for you to go get this education. How are you going to apply that education? So you know my dad, you know, never made it out of the eighth grade. So he got into the real estate business, and he was just like, I didn't need college. I took a lot of courses. I took you know I studied this, 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 but I learned by doing it. Just got really good at a craft. Yeah, and I I, I honed it in, and I did that, and so. He really couldn't understand that he just couldn't comprehend how everybody was sending their kids to these expensive schools with no outcome on the back end. It just didn't add up for him. Meanwhile, both of my sisters went, right? Like my my middle sister was the first of our whole family to go to, to go to college. So that was great. But like I didn't. And so it was it was a different perspective. I actually ended up going to the police academy uh in in Polk County, Florida, not too far from you. Imagine growing up in uh 
you know, a suburban neighborhood in, in Boston and uh, at 19 years old, getting dropped into Winter Haven, Florida. I'm from the Boston area too. So I understand both pieces of that. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a different world. And uh, I was 19. I graduated the police academy at 19 and you have four years back then to uh, get a job, went home, started DJing. I had a friend that had, had I, I met him at a wedding and I was like, Hey, I'll do anything. I'll carry your equipment. I just want to learn. Like, this is amazing. So I did that. And I got back from the academy. I was like, hey, I need help. Can you fill in at this bar? I was like, 19. I'm like, of course. And next thing you know, I was doing five nights a week in Boston, making a lot of money. It was great. DJing. DJing. And just going crazy. Uh, it, it, doing all My friends could come to bars with me. I was like the king of the world. But so it was funny because working in bars, you know, you're able to, at a young age, I, I still got that college experience, right? So I'm around all people my age, I'm in that same environment they are, I'm just not going to class, right? And so I'm, I'm getting all this business experience. And as a DJ, you're your everything. So I had to be my own graphic designer. I had to be my own IT person. I had to be, figure out all the technical aspects. And I'm like building systems and nightclubs now, and I'm starting to do all this stuff. And it was great, but my accreditation was about to expire. So I needed to get back to Florida. And so I had four years. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to go back. And I eventually made my way to Fort Lauderdale. I got uh, hired by the Oakland Park Police Department, uh, which is a small little uh, section of Fort Lauderdale. And this was back in 99. And email wasn't what it is today. And they sent you a formal letter to let you know that the city had been absorbed by the sheriff's department. Your job didn't exist. So by the time I got there, I didn't have a job. So I had a job. I got there. It was just a crazy ride. At the end of the day, I realized that what I needed to do was get get back into music. I loved music and I needed to just go. And I, I knew I needed benefits. So I'm like, how do you get benefits in music? And so I decided to go into radio. Um, I went to a, a, a trade school. There's a few of them uh, in the New England area and and in Florida too. And I moved back home with my parents and I had to uh, go go to school and, and get all I needed to do, honestly, was I needed my foot in the door. And so this was the easiest way for me to get an internship because I knew once you got in, it was going to be on you to uh, to deliver. You know, I got home from Florida that last time with no money. I mean, literally, we I had nothing left. My car was repossessed. Like it, as soon as I got home to Massachusetts, like that tow truck pulled up and hitched that car pretty quick. Uh, so I hadn't made a payment since I'd been because I had no money. I ran out of money, and so yeah, it was a it was a wild time. But it was this moment where where I had to you know make a change as well. Do you think that that hitting that where you got the job, then your job got taken away, and then you had no money left? Was that kind of like a trigger? Like this is not what you want to do. Was that? Was that what kind of? Yeah. I mean, you're sort of sitting there. Yeah. I mean, there were a couple of things. One, when I was in the police academy, there was a, an older gentleman in our group, in our core. And I, 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 got under, I learned of his story and he was there as a tribute to his son who was 21 and shot and killed in the line of duty, which that stayed with me. Like that was, and then come to find out it was on the street that I moved into when I got there. I'm like, oh man, this is woo. That was pretty real. Like I would run by the woods where he ran and this 21 year old kid ran in to chase somebody and ended up not coming out of those woods like that. That kind of stuck with me a little bit. And and then again, when I was back in Fort Lauderdale, there was another when I was there, you know, I was waiting tables trying to get another job and another you know police officer was shot. And I'm like, it wasn't quite that chips fantasy. Yeah, I'm like, this is th- th- it was different than Boston, right? In Boston back then, when the police showed up, you stopped. You were like, whoa, I don't want, okay. Like, and, and down there, it was like, okay, let's do this. Like, we're going to tangle. And I was like, this is just different. And it was just a very different experience for me. And, and there was something telling me that wasn't where I was supposed to, well, what I was supposed to be doing. And this commercial came on the TV one day and it was like, you can work in the radio and TV industry. And I'm like, I could totally do that. And I I should note, this was also at the point where all my friends were graduating college. And so all of my friends that I went to high school with were now graduating and getting their jobs. And so they were starting a path towards a career. And I was like, wait, 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 I can't fall behind. I've got to, I've got to get, what's my career? What's my answer to that question? And so uh, I think that was a big moment for me, for sure. I mean, there's kind of that societal pressure or peer pressure to, to keep up, right? But also like, oh, I'm an adult now. I have to have benefits and I need to like 
not have a car repossessed and I need to be able to do the things. <laughs> You know, if my friends asked me to go out, I'd like to go out with them. Yeah. But if I can't, if I don't have a job. So you got, did, after going to that school and trade schools are great. Amazing. Like, I feel like trade schools need to be promoted even more now, right? 100%. Everyone's going through, cause I, I wonder how your friends experience compared to yours. Cause when you talked about your DJing experience, like that sounds like a really great learning experience and probably a lot more than what your friends were experiencing in their, you know, history class in college. Yeah. I mean, I came out with business experience. I came out with relationship experience. I mean, at the same age, I mean, by the time I got into getting my full-time job at the radio station, it's actually a wild, I mean, it was a wild story too, but I got hired full-time. I was intern and I was working on a project and this, this web guy says to me, Hey, do you know how to edit video on a laptop? And I'm like, Oh, of course I didn't. The <laughs> editing software we used at our high school wasn't software, it was hardware. It was 1993, so we had hardware, uh, but I'm like, it has to be the same. And so I literally sat in front of that computer like for days and I figured it out how to do it on the computer. And long story short, a few months later, he gets recruited by a competing radio station and they say, is there anybody else? And he's like, there's an intern over there we need to go talk to. And they brought me over and they put me in charge of this team. And it was a small team at the time of four people. And they'd all been there a long time. And I was brought in as the boss. And within two weeks, one of the guys erupted on me and was like, I, I do not work for you. And I was like, well, you, you kind of do. And he was like, <laughs> I have my master's degree from Boston University. And you don't even have anything. Like, I don't work for you. And I was like, you're right. You don't because you're fired. But <laughs> like, <laughs> like we're, we're, I didn't have to fire him. He actually quit before the morning. But you know, it it was this it was this fear though that I carried with myself for a very long time that I didn't have the credentials to stack up against the people that were there. So I think that's changed in the last twenty years. I think that's changed for people that if you do go to that that trade school, you come in with those skills that there's a comfort. I hope that there is because it wasn't for me. It was terrifying that somebody was going to ask for my credentials at some point. Right, like you were just like, but it's hard because. I mean, you probably had some imposter syndrome of some sort because you oh, didn't no. have that degree that other people had. But at the same time, you had all that real world experience in which, I mean, life teaches us a lot more than a textbook does. A hundred percent. And that's why, I mean, I've, with, with starting my own company now, like I've removed all college requirements from all of our, all, when we post jobs, I do not require it. Like it's nice to have, but like. I'm hiring graphic designers. Like you can either design or you can't like you're, you either understand this or you don't. And you're a video editor. Can you edit? Right? Like my former creative director, one of my favorite things he did when he was hiring editors, he walked them in, put them in front of a computer and said, edit. Like I can interview all day long, but that doesn't mean you know how to do this job. And so it's the same thing I say with like leadership is leadership it doesn't come with tenure. Sure, it helps to get experience, but you either have that or you don't. And so often people just because it's time and it's like, no, you this is where you're supposed to be. And sometimes that 24 year old is supposed to be above you because it's just that they're, they're wired differently and that's okay too. So yeah, that was a big one for me for sure. Having to come to grips with that. And to be honest, it didn't happen. I, I got turned down for, for, for a big job. Um, going to work for Coors, um, for Coors Brewing Company back in the day. And I got the job. They called me They're like, dude, you nailed your interview. You're, you're totally right for this. And they called me 25 minutes later and they were like, do you, you don't have a degree? And I was like, no, They're like, we can't hire you. And I was like, okay, I was devastated. And I remember going home and talking to my now wife and I'm like, whoa. And, you know, we talked about it. Like, do I go back and get a, you know, get a, get a degree just to have the piece of paper so I can because I've already proven I'm capable of doing this job. And I said, you know what, if I, if I run into more roadblocks, we'll talk about it. And that was my last roadblock. It never stopped me again. We keep talking a little bit about your company, but what did you do to get you to, to start your own thing? Because it sounds like, you know, you've had a long storied career before this company, right? Yeah. So yeah, I was in the radio side. This is, this is my third startup. So I started a promotional, a promotional agency when I was 24 years old with two buddies. We ran all the promotional activations for 
a lot of the beer companies. We ended up expanding up through Southern New Hampshire, through Massachusetts, all the way down to Rhode Island. That was a great learning experience. That for me, I still had my full-time job and my two buddies were running the company that I, you know, we, we came up with. And it was an amazing experience. When that ended, you know, that was just great. I started a DJ business. It was actually funny. I got married. I realized how much money the wedding band made. And I always wanted to, we, as my wife and I were figuring out wanting to have kids, I always wanted her to have the ability to stay home if she chose to and not feel like she had to, again, another chip on the shoulder of like, whoa, I've got to make more money here. Like what if, right? And so I knew what she made as a teacher and I knew that I could do 25 weddings a year and, and make that same salary, <laughs> replicate her salary. And so I did it. We should pause just for that fact that these teachers are there's so much responsibility no doubt. for a teacher these days and no 25 doubt. weddings crazy. can equal the salary it's less than that it's well they probably make more now but yeah i mean it, that's what it was for me and i just went out and built the built the company and did that and it was great and then fast forward i got recruited uh, boss my boss left and went to the, the miami dolphins and he came back and I always joke that the calls always come in at the worst possible time, right? The doors knock. It's whether you're ready, you know, it's all that thing, you know, it's, you're prepared for that moment. And I had been preparing for the moment for, for many years at that point, I was ready. I knew I needed somebody to leave that radio station and give me the nod because nobody else knew what I did. I was sort of the secret sauce behind the scenes. I wasn't, you know, at that point in my career and Finally, the call came and it was like, it was the day before Christmas Eve. And he said, I need you in Miami on New Year's Day. And I'm like, okay, I guess we're, and my wife, I should know it was five months pregnant and four months pregnant, whatever it was. And we had to go and we talked about it. We're like, this is the life changing moment. Like you get a job doing what I'm about to go do for an NFL franchise. This could change your life. And we went, there were a few of us that went down. There were others that were offered the opportunity to go down and they couldn't make it that day. You know, I tell everybody it's, everybody likes to talk the talk, but it's another, another thing when you have to put your foot on that plane. When you step across from the gangway to the plane, you have made a decision at that point. And it is terrifying, physically terrifying. And then the day comes and you're moving and you're going and you're gone. And it is like, whoa, I just left my place. I just left the industry, the city that I had made a name for myself for over 10 years. Like I was, I was a commodity. Like I was known and I'm walking away because I had outgrown it. It was time for me just to go beyond that. And so I left there, went to the Miami Dolphins. I was there for parts of, I think, four seasons, through total of three years. And the CEO of the Dolphins left and went to the San Diego Padres. I had the opportunity uh, to join the organization as the chief marketing officer for the Padres back in 2013. Was that move a little easier? In theory, yes. You're going across the country. We'd already decided we were only, a, it's a flight as a flight as a flight. In practice, going to the West Coast is a lot harder to keep up with your East Coast friends. Going to the West Coast it's, it's, you're, you're removed. You're in a different, you're in a different place. And then we couldn't sell our house in Florida. And my wife and two little girls at that point had to stay behind. And I lived out here by myself for just over five months. And my wife was back in Florida with, uh, I don't know, a three-year-old and an eight, 18 month old by herself. And so, yeah, so in theory, yes, but in practice, it was way harder. And I was, during spring training, I didn't get to go back. So I was six weeks without seeing them. And then, then they moved here. And, and again, it was tough. It was friction. It was all the things that you don't want it to be, but those are the things that make it so worth it when you get here. So I was here for, I was with the Padres for seven years, seven seasons, and we were tasked. I got hired to redefine the brand of the Padres, define it, if you will, because it had kind of lost its way for, for a long time, redefine the entertainment experience uh, at Petco Park which was an amazing challenge. You know, again, all the DJ experience, all the music experience, all those things coming together, rebuild the communications team and, and a communication strategy, PR strategy for the team, and then uh, social media and come in and, and completely overhaul the storytelling for the franchise. So about the end of 2018, we finished the biggest project that that whole thing builds up to, which is a redesign of the brand, redesigning the uniforms and logos for the, for the team. We finished that work at the end of 2018. You kind of look ahead and you go, what's next? 
right? I, I, I always challenge my team and, and my employees to go, what's next for you? Like you've got it. If you're showing up for this paycheck, it's not enough, right? There's way more money to be made out there. You're doing this because you love it and you want to grow. What's next? What's I, I, my, one of my favorite stories was a kid came into me. He's a graphic designer. He was a talented artist. And I was like, what's next? He was like, I want to be a video editor. I'm like you're like so talented. He's like, yeah, but I really want to learn that. I'm like, okay. So within two years he was doing that and now he's versatile, right? He, he knew for himself, he had the art. Amazing. I love that. Cause that's where he wanted to go. We didn't force him in that direction. Well, and there's something to be said about leadership, acknowledging that. No doubt. Like the fact that, that you were like, okay. Yeah. I mean, there's not a lot of bosses or leaders that well, leaders would do it. Bosses, Correct. maybe not, you know, That's in the, the sense that, no, I hired you for this. Too bad. No. And I, I think with, yeah, with this generation and, and, and especially with creatives, it's, they're going to evolve, right? And you can't put them in a box. And so many people try to, they try to do it with me. Like, okay, you're going to be a sales guy. I'm like, but I don't want to be a sales guy. Well, but that's, that's what we're, that's what I need you to do. Like, okay, I'll do it, but it's not my thing. Like, you know, and, but you got to kind of, if you can, people will travel in the path of least resistance to results, right? They, if you, if you open up the flow and you move that rock over just a little bit, the creativity that's going to come out of that person is, is unbelievable versus forcing them into a corner and being like, you know, color inside the lines. Like, well, no, what happens if we went outside the lines? Oh, wow. That became beautiful. And so I love that with creatives. And so I had these conversations. I was doing it for myself at that point and kind of determining what I wanted to do next. The next challenge for the, for the organization was to go win a world series. And that's amazing for the organization, but as a selfish human, that doesn't do much for me. I didn't sign up to win a world series. I signed up to build brands. I signed up to fix a brand. I love to fix things that, that are broken. And so that's my favorite thing and bring it back and, and guide it there. So I had the same conversation with one of my employees and I said, what are you going to do next? And this is back in 2018. And she looked at me and she goes, enough of your questions. I'm turning the table on you. What are you doing next? Cause I can already see that you're bored. And I said, I'm going to, I'm going to have to leave. And she goes, okay, when are you leaving? I said, I don't know, like two or three years. I want to, I want to, I want to finish this work. I want to get this on. I want to get this uniforms on the field. I want to do all these things. And I want to make sure the organization and the team is set up for success. And then I want to kind of go do my own thing. I want to go help other brands and help other people. And she, without hesitation was like, yeah, I like that. Let's go do that. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. like you could be the next me. Like this, this is, you know, that was sort of my plan was that like you, she was like, I've already done that too. Like we've done this, we've built this. I've already, I, you and I are the same. Like, let's go do some other stuff. Just like a, a random conversation of, of growth within sparked all this. Yeah. I mean, it was, I knew what I was doing, but it was, a, no, it's a scheduled, what do you do next meeting? Like, what's your plan? Like, what do you want to do? And, and she had thought about it and was like, I know he, I know him. He's not staying like he's bored. And, you know, an average CMO lasts 3.5 years. I was there seven. I had two lives. It was amazing. My boss, my boss that brought me left in 2016, I reported directly to the owner for the next four years. So I did have two lives. I had two completely different experiences. So it had run its cycle for me. And so we started thinking about it. We started building plans. We worked with mentors and built a plan. And, you know, by the end of 2020, um, in the craziest year of our lives, we gave our notice a year ago, uh, right now, uh, I mean, two years ago, right now, we, we left, we left our big jobs. <laughs> you know, and, and that's, I mean, that's amazing. I love that, that like, I think, and, and this goes back to what I said earlier on, is that so many people are conditioned that they just have to stay somewhere or their next goal is like whatever is promoted to me or the next step. Whereas because you didn't have that traditional expectation of you, it's like you could do like anything is is up. I mean, you went from DJing to chief marketing <laughs> officer, right, of the Padres. like No doubt. That's not even a traditional path for, I mean, that's not even a getting to CMO position for someone with a four-year degree is not. No doubt. Like that, you know, like, so there's something cool about the fact that 
because you weren't boxed in, you probably this probably was afforded to you because of that. Yeah, and I think you know, I also think it was really hard for a, for many people to understand how I was able to do that job because they had bought into the traditional systems, right? Like I, I often said, like I know this was promised to you, and it was never promised to me. And I believe that's kind of why I have it and you don't like it, it, you had this expectation that, that you were entitled to it, right? Like the, the, I didn't have any safety net. I didn't have any entitlement. I had no promises. The only promise I have is that you can come back tomorrow and try again and keep coming back. And, you know, there was a moment in time when I had to go report, you know, to, to, to the owner of the team. And we had a really honest conversation about what, 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 what I did. And he hadn't really had vision into what I did and was like, I don't quite get you. You know, you don't add up. <laughs> like I read all your paperwork. None of it adds up. Like, but let's see what you got. And very quickly became very, very, very close. And he was like, I get it now. I see what you do. I understand. I see your people. I understand it's it, marketing and brand and creativity is a human game. And so it is connecting with, with creatives and allowing them I always joke, my our, my creative director, Quento now, like he'll sell me something and I'll be like, oh, it's amazing. Like, sure. Is there something I might have tweaked a little bit differently? Absolutely. Do I know that that absolutely eats away at the soul of a creative? Because it, he connected it to 17 other things that all in his mind made it perfect. And I'm going to tweak that little thing because, oh, maybe because I can, right? Because I'm the boss and I have the power to tell you, tweak that. I got to the point where I was like, guys, you guys are so good at what you do. Like, unless it's wrong, right? If it's off brand, if it's not right, if you, if you went too far, I, but the, the job was to create the guardrails and keep them in there, but let them ping pong ball around and get creative and come up with just crazy things. Because that's what, you know, as my old boss used to say, that's when the, that's when the, the rainbows and sunshine and just magic comes out of that hose. And like, all you got to do is just point that hose in the right direction. Too many people believe they are, they know it better than you do because of the position that they've ascended to because they deserved that. Do you position. think they think that, or do you think they like feel like they have to say something to like prove a point? That's exactly <laughs> it. I think a lot of people believe when you ascend to this position and I'll, I'll be honest, when I first got there, I thought so too. Like I've got to put my stamp on this. I've got to, and you're going, no, no, I don't. Like I have to study the research, study the data, understand where we're trying to move this brand and then make the decisions and put the right people in place, empower them to be amazing and then watch what happens. Because now if they're not amazing, listen, I, I had bad hires too, but very quickly, most of the time they voted themselves off the island because if the rest of the island is all marching and going and let's go, let's go and having a good time with it, you'll quickly realize, whoa, I am outmatched here. Like, I don't want to put in the hours. I mean, the hours are crazy. I mean, it was, it was, I, I joked, it was 24 seven for me. You know, from the time that I was in radio, there was a moment, at, it was Thanksgiving week. My wife and I, and the kids, we flew to Orlando to go to Disney in 2020. Like they just opened, Sorry. right? And, uh, <laughs> and no, but it was honestly like, Actually, there weren't that a lot of people there. There was nobody there. So it was perfect. And <laughs> it was really not that expensive. It was great. But it was the first time I put my phone down. And I put it in my wife's purse and I was like, here, you can hold this one. I had two phones. I had my, my personal phone and I put the business phone away. So my last day was on Monday. And I was like, there's nobody calling that phone this week. They're just, it's it. It's over. I remember when I left the Dolphins, there was a major news story broke two days after I gave my notice. And it was the first time my phone wasn't one of the phones ringing. And I was like, okay. I'm out <laughs> like, no, I, I, you want to be in, you want to help. Like it's your friends. You're like, you want to be there to help them. But they're like, we got to move on. Like you're not part of this anymore. You're, you know, Do you thrive on that. Like always busy. Is that like, yeah, I love that. I love being busy. I love, I love having different, like I joke all the time that they'll be like, especially now with like Quento, we work with a bunch of different clients, right. And brands and, and all of the, all of them have my phone number. And part of the services is that I'm here for you. Like, let's talk it through. And so, uh, the other day I went to the gym and I got home and it was like, I don't know, three hours later, my wife was like, you're at the gym that whole time. Like, that's crazy. And I was like, no, when I pulled in the phone rang 
And that was a pivot in my day. <laughs> it was like somebody needed something and I'm going to stop what I'm doing right now. And I had that hole. It was going to be a little bit of for me and it wasn't. And it was like, okay, let's solve this problem. Like I love that now we're in the solutions business, right? Helping people that have real problems, not manufactured problems, not a problem because of, you know, so-and-so doesn't like this. Like, okay, well, let's, okay, we'll change it, but it's not wrong, you know? And like, and now it's like when, when you're getting paid as a consultant, you're being brought in to solve real problems. Right. And they need your help. They need help. It's great. And they know, and what do you want to be known for? You want to be known for the person that, that has those solutions. Was there, what period, or like, was there something about your experience towards the end of the Padres position that, that you knew, like, was there anything that like triggered, like, I know it's time to, to carry on, to do my own thing. I think once we had the, had the work done and looked at it and we're like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then we had that sort of runway of like, okay, it's the end of 2018. We finished the uniforms. We're going to go to 2019. We're going to unveil the uniforms after that season. So we have to keep them a secret for a whole year. But, but there's a lot of work that has to be done in the next year to get ready for that unveil, right? All the merchandise has to be produced so that when you do unveil, there's stuff to buy, right? Like all that work has to be done. So that's, that's going to be a lot of fun. And then we have to wait through that off season. We have to, we have to change all the graphics for the entire ballpark have to switch to a new color scheme. So that's another huge project that we have to do. So I, I saw that, but every step of the way in my career, I knew what was coming next. As I got into like a leadership position, I knew it was coming next because then I could start when that kid comes to me and says, I want to be a, a video editor, not a graphic designer. I know what two, three years ahead looks like. So I can start. To, I, I promised him. I said, listen, I can't get you there today. But if there's a little project I can throw you away within the next couple of years, we'll get you there. And within two years, he was there because I saw it was coming. It was the first time I couldn't tell you what was coming. Right. It, from a brand standpoint, we were going to go win. Okay. I never worked for winning teams. Like that wasn't what I did. Right. I was brought in to fix things. So yeah, it was like, I think it was that moment in time. And when I looked around and my number two, Katie, who's now my business partner was also seeing that I was bored and was also, I could see she was bored and that concerned me because I was like, Whoa, I've maxed her out. Like, I don't know what else I could give her. I gave her a whole other department to run. She's running that one. Like, I'm going to, like, we're going to lose. Like, we, there's not enough here to sustain all of our needs to water all of these plants. <laughs> like, they're just as. And I wonder if there's a similarity to, because that was such a large project and it came to the end. I, I recently finished, I, I was very bored during 2020. So I decided to get another master's degree. Wow. Just, because you can throw one my so way. now I have two if you want one yeah <laughs> I have two but when I was done it was like okay it was just like now what right you know like it was all this build up build up build up to graduation and then it's over yep and you're like did you have that same kind of feeling with that big rebrand of the Padres and then it was done and you're like well, yeah what else could I do yeah you're I think we're always in, into your, to your credit though, we're always trying to improve. I think not everybody, but most people are always trying to improve, right? Especially the people that like on my team and like the people that I was surrounded by, you know, you're in professional sports. It's a, a, you know, there's a level of adrenaline, right? That you're, it's a big stage. You get to, I get to, I love putting on shows. You ask what, like what drives me? I love putting on a show. I love that. Like that's, from when I was a DJ to standing on a field with 45,000 people being like, or at an NFL stadium being like, here we go. Like the script is going to run the videos that we, re, you know, we're going to, we're going to wow these people today. I love that. And I think for me looking out, not having, I think we're always trying to like move to that. It was like, what's next? Like I've done it now. Like I've done opening day. You've done a big, yeah. a big project. Yeah. And I was like, I, I, I did a rebrand of a team with my team who we all did this. It was so amazing. And, you know, kudos to, to our owner who allowed us to do it without outside influence. We didn't hire an outside agency. We didn't, we didn't have the league office do it. It was done in house. We did all the research. We did everything. And it was like, wow, this is so amazing. We had this experience and, 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 now you should always be asking yourself, how do I then apply that to what's next? And hopefully it's within the organization that you're in. 
right? There are organizations that have said, Hopefully wow. for them. Yeah, no doubt. Like they've gone, wow, we've got something special here. How do we harness it? But other organizations want to stay solely focused into the goal that they have in mind, which is great too. But then you have to look at yourself and go, do I stay or do I do what's best for me? And I, you know, I, I always, the thing that I, I focus on is the five things that, that make me happy and applying whether I'm, I'm living up to them or I'm not. And most important to, to my wife and, and in our family was that we stayed here in San Diego. This was home. We wanted to be here. We wanted our kids to stay in the schools that they were in or with all their friends. And I wanted to take control of my own destiny. I wanted to control that and make sure that it was going to be on my back, whether we got to do that or not, and, and, and nobody else's. So 2020, you launched Quento Marketing? Yeah, we launched Quento in 2019. Um, so we, uh, we, we did some you know nights and weekends trying to figure it out, right? Want to make sure we had it right. Put that safety net in, right? Let's try some things out. And we had some friends that needed some help. So we were just doing little projects, just nights and weekends. Like we worked around the clock, right? And meanwhile, launching all the other things we had to do. Like, right. And that, ha- that was number one priority. We had to get, we, as I said, like, I want to leave this thing way better than the way I found it. But, you know, we were doing little projects. The, it was probably about July of 2020 when the baseball season was about to start. And we had to kind of make a decision at that point. Okay. Do we feel like this is the path or we tried it? What do we think? And we were like, it's, it's go time. Let's, let's, let's go strong through this season. Let's have a great year. And then when the season's over, we're going to step away. And so that's what we did. And, you know, uh, everybody was amazing. Uh, we appreciated the support and understood, you know, we had done what we came to do and they had things to do. And, uh, you know, my boss used to say to me like old way back in the day is that, it's like a, the chapters of the book, right? And you've got to determine whether you want to be part of the next chapter. We were turning the page on a chapter and you have to look around and evaluate what that next chapter, what that next chapter is going to be about, who the players are in that next chapter and whether you want to be a player in that, in, in, in that, in that chapter. And it just wasn't a fit for me and that's okay. Well, when you, when you launched like, what was your first? I mean, you don't have to say who they were, but what was your first like big project that someone came to you and like, we know you are known for this. Yeah. Yeah. That no. probably has to feel really good, but yeah, it was amazing. So there were two guys from Chicago purchased a brand uh, called Ballast Point. They purchased it back from Constellation Brands. Uh, it had been sold to Constellation Brands for a billion dollars, like five years prior. These guys purchased it, brought it back to San Diego and through a mutual contact had said, Hey, we, we heard you are looking to do your own thing and you are up to speed on the San Diego market, build brands. You know, you could do this. Can you help us? You got the clout. And, yeah. And so that was the first one that was a big, I mean, I had a few, we had a few other projects with, 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 with our friends that we did some projects for that we still work with today that are amazing. But like the big one, the big massive brand that landed on your plate, you're like, Oh wow, this is real. Was 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 that one, and that was amazing. And you know, from there, we're we're working with uh, teams in, in in Major League Baseball now. Um, we're working with uh, a couple of those. We're working with a lot of B two B because what we've really learned was that the lessons from sports apply across all industries. If you've been in sales, every sales manager is up there making sports analogies every day. You know, like ah, well what better way than bringing actual lessons from the world of sports into your business? Because especially in storytelling, it's so natural for sports teams to tell their own story because from day one, the newspapers have been covering you. People have been writing stories about teams and players. So it was natural for sports teams, you know, coming out of the media side was when sports teams realized they needed to be their own storyteller. Like now looking back, you can see what happened in my career, Right. I was a storyteller. I was an entertainer. I got into broadcast. I became a storyteller and a brand integrator, taking brands and putting them in with talent and making, you know, sponsored content before it was a thing, right? And you go to the NFL, you do the same thing. And you work integrating brands into shows and making it really exciting for fans and driving attendance and revenue. Then you go to baseball, you do the same thing. And what you realize is the teams realized they needed to become storytellers, right? And so now 
everybody's realizing they need to become storytellers. So if people that were in the, the media world, Katie and I both came from the media world in sports. So we both worked for media companies. We both worked for sports teams. And then you take that out into the, to the general business marketplace and working with, you know, we worked with this insurance company here in San Diego uh, and they came to me and said, Hey, it's very easy to make a baseball player look sexy, but uh, I challenge you to make insurance look sexy. I love that, but we did, right? The challenge, they wanted to be different. They wanted to be known as different. They want to do these things. We put them out in the marketplace. Everybody in insurance is using blues and golds and silvers. And they're using pinks and yellows and, and just amazing colors because that's who they are. They are this diverse, eclectic office that's like, yes, let's celebrate that in our brand. Let's show it off. But they knew who they wanted to be three years ago and they're living up to it today. And so uh, it's been it's been an amazing journey for sure. And you said that you started a couple companies before. Is this one quite different for you in the way that you feel about it? 100%. This is my everything. Like everything I've done to this point has led up to this vision. I've always wanted to consult. I've always wanted to help people solve problems. I, during the pandemic, my wife, my, I went nonstop. One of the things that I did was I put a message out on LinkedIn that, after we made the leap and we left, I was like, so many people have reached out asking me about this. Please send me a message. Let's jump on a Zoom call. I'm happy to talk to you about it if you're having a tough time. Or, and my wife was like, you've done more free calls than business. Like, are we going to be able to pay the bills? And I was like, you know what? I've always wanted to help people. And this was part of this jump for me was that it allowed me to have the platform to actually go out and show people you can do whatever you want to do. And you can't do it overnight. Katie and I didn't wake up in, in, in October of 2020 and go, we're out. Yeah. It was, exactly. you know, October of 2018 when we started to go, okay, what are we going to do? And then building plans. And meanwhile, not missing a beat at work, grinding every day. And I had done that at every step of the way of having that capacity to do those things. But I think for me with this one, it's also a collection of like some of my favorite people. So you know, folks that uh, came over from, from from when when I was at the Padres who have come over to join us at Quento. Our web developer was my web developer when I was with the Dolphins. Er, just putting this group of people together that believe in in Katie and I and what we're trying to build and want to be part of the journey of building something from scratch. It's not the same. We don't have the same toys we had before. We don't have the same. I joke all the time that. When we moved, when I had a new hire when working in, in the corporate world, I just added some numbers to a spreadsheet. Somebody figured out how to actually write that check, right? Well, now when we add a new hire, like we have to figure out how to write that check and it's a completely different world, but I, we're, we're about to do, I, I can't give the location yet because it's a surprise, but we just surprised our team this week and we're flying everybody to a surprise location for a holiday party this year. And I got to tell you, it, it's probably one of, I am just beyond myself with excitement that we've built something that could do this and not only sustain and grow Katie and I, but to have all these people that we care about be a part of it and also watch them grow and prosper and create. One, our creative director, he's a maniac, but he put, he built a CNC, he had a CNC machine in his garage. It's his hobby. It's what he likes to do. All of a sudden, we're doing this shoot for the Oakland A's last spring. And he's like, I have this idea. I'm like, okay. So he starts showing me all these 3D renderings. He's like, I'm going to build this in my garage. I'm like, okay. And we get over to spring <laughs> training. He drives the whole thing over, built this ins insane set. He cut every piece out. And we're like, but you know what? That We could never have done that in our past life. There, the, the stakes were too high. Like There were too many players involved. Like This was like, I believe in you. Yes. Like I know – you're going to do that. Like, uh, let's do it. And if it doesn't, we'll fix it. Like, we'll make it work. Like, we will make it work. And he did it. It was great. And now, I mean, we had more fun that week. We like, I can't believe you made this. This is unbelievable. And I think for me, that has been honestly just, just a blessing to be able to live the life I, I wanted to live with my family. I'm coaching my daughter's flag football team. I could never do that before. Just things that and maybe I could have. But guess what? I put the pressure on myself that I couldn't. And I couldn't, I, I, because the schedule was so, you know, just. And you were performing for someone else. That's it. That's it. Yeah. And now you're able to curate 
a bunch of like-minded or not like-minded, however, whatever you need, whatever you want that supports your own. It's funny because as I talk to you from the beginning of this podcast to the end, the energy that you have when you talk about your own company is is quite different than, you know, your other yeah. experiences. So we can tell that you like it. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. You, you know, here's the thing. When, 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 you, when you perform for someone else, that's a great line. Like, when, but when you're under someone else's world, which is okay, it's amazing, right? There's, there's benefits to it. But you're playing within the rules that are set up for you. And now I get to play within the rules that I set up for myself. So my travel schedule is 10 times worse than it was before. But I'm determining that. I, I, so like my wife will joke that like I travel a lot more than I used to, but it's around the stuff that we already have on the calendar. So I'm home for a lot more, right? So it's very controlled when I'm where I go and very rarely is it like, oh no, I have to go right now. You know, it's like, no, I have to go within the next three weeks. What days work best? I'm going to shoot out and do this. And so um, I think that's been, been, been really fun. And, you know, when we go on the road or we do a big shoot in a location, we rent a huge Airbnb and the whole team stays in the house and we get to like, cause we're a remote company. It's our chance to actually all be together. And it's just, it's, it's really fun. Yeah. And, and I think what's important about the conversation too, is like, you probably wouldn't be able to have this successful company without going through all of the things that you did before. Right. So, I mean, there's something to be said about having to, you know, work for someone else and make mistakes on their dime. Yeah, no, I know. I loved what I did. I loved working for the people I worked for. I had amazing bosses, amazing mentors, amazing experience, but I had a goal in mind, right? So I was making decisions with purpose and it was, Always, always, you know, at one point in my career, I had this program director sit me down and he was like, you know, he was new. He said, you know, you make decisions with your best interest in mind first. And I was like, that's where you're wrong. I'm like, I, I, I always put the company first, right? It was like, what's in the best interest of the company? How do we deliver against that? Because what do you want to be known for, right? Because if you're known that you've always delivered for the company, yes, you did all these other things. Right. Like my, my old boss at the radio station was like, you're DJing on the weekends. You're doing this, you're doing this. I'm like, but how are my results during the week? And when you call me, am I available? Like I, and it was always a yes. And he's like, you know what? You're right. Like I can't even like, you're right. Like I, you choose when everybody else goes home to go work something else because creatively it, it helps you and financially it's helping you. Like that's good too. And, and I think, I, I, I think working in, in the corporate world was amazing. You learn a lot. You learn just as much from people of what you want to be as I think you learn more about what you don't want to be. And if you're actually looking for those lessons along the way and, and, and purposely log them of like, you know what, when I become a boss, I remember one of the things that stuck with me is I never want people coming to me having to like beg for more money. I felt like I had to fight every year for a raise when I was younger. Like every year, I'm like, dude, you know, I need a little bit more. Come on, I got, I got, I got, you know, I got to get to get married. All these things, and I was like, I, I want people to know where they're going, and I want them to know what that looks like if they achieve these things. This is what it is, and it, there's no question. It's black and white. Like I want you to get more. I want everybody to make more money, right? But how do we get you there? Well, I need you to do these things, you know. And I'll, I'll just, I'll tell you this one real quick because I think it's important. I had this, this one moment it happened. This kid came to me and he said, "Hey, I, I found out that you thank you for the raise, thank you, but I found out that the kid next to me got a thousand dollars more a year than I did." And I'm like, "Yeah, he did. He did." And he was like, "Well, I, can I get that too?" I was like, "No, you can't." I'm like, we're going to have a very honest discussion. He's like, okay. And I said, talk to me. He's like, well, my dad said I have to come in and, you know, I have to fight for every dollar. And I said, look, your dad sounds like my dad. My dad told me those who work for free never run out of work. And I needed to go find a way to pay my own bills, right? I said, but you're looking in the wrong direction. You're looking over here at this kid that made, he's going to make $1,000 more than you next year. Well, here are the four of the things that he does that you haven't done yet. Like, these are the things you need to achieve. That got him a little bit more money. But what I need you to do is realize that if you just stop looking at your right and looking at his feet and looking at the little bit more he made than you, and you look to your left, she got $10,000 more a year than you did. And if you want to look down the hall, that was 15. He was like, what? And I was like, we're going to have an honest talk. 
you're looking in the wrong direction. I need you to lift your head up and look at look look on the horizon of the things that are possible for you. But you've got to start shooting for bigger opportunities and stop nitpicking over this is not going to make a difference in your life, but that would. And he called me, I think it was last year, and he got his big raise. And he was like, thank you. You, I, 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 cause he was so negative about it. I'm like, if you look up there and you see what you need to achieve, he was like, I worked my butt off to do these things. And when the time was right, I just, I got that paycheck. And he was like, and you're right. My life is different now. And the negativity was slowing me down from even competing with that guy to now blowing by him and, and having this experience or going with him, whatever. I don't know what the other guy did, but like he got, he got to where he wanted, where he should have gone. He deserved it. He just couldn't think that way, right? Because he came from he came from a family where it was a blue collar family where you fight for every dollar you get, right? You have to go in and ask for that extra 50 cents an hour raise, right? Because that's where I came from. And it's not like that in the corporate America. You have to climb. And if you can take a jump up there, I had no idea that that was possible. I thought you got an extra $2,000 a year and you were happy with it. <laughs> like, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You know, I, and what strikes me, and we'll wrap this up in a second, but what strikes me is when you said you you kind of move forward in life with purpose. Like everything that you're doing has a purpose mm -hmm. to it. And my brain takes me back to your upbringing and the fact that you didn't have this this kind of society box that was that was provided to you in which someone like myself, whether that was self-imposed or not, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think that is the difference between someone that is just kind of going through life with the next thing, kind of like the story that you just shared, you know, like you're just expecting that next raise and then you'll go through that. This is what's led you to be able to have your own company, curate your own group of people doing amazing things, curate your own clients, right? You can pick and choose who you want to work with and work for. No doubt. So I think that's a nice takeaway is to, that we should be leaning into these things that that fill what you said you had a list of five things that you always yep. think of uh, when you make your decisions. I think if we can create those for ourselves, I think our lives will be more fulfilled and more maybe exciting or enjoyable in some sense. It seems that you've found that space. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I think, I think when you figure out what really matters to you and start making decisions to ladder up to that, that success is truly about happiness, right? It's truly about God. I got to do that this week. Like, you know, the things that matter and, and when you do achieve them, for, for example, I want to spend more time with my kids when I'm actually coaching flag football, right? I'm going, man, I made the right decisions. Like this, this got me to this. And then I'm appreciative of that moment, which allows me to actually be happier, right? Because I realized the work I did and I, I'll tell you in 2018, I, 2019 was going to be a rough year. I knew it because I was going to have to do all these nights and weekends to get all this all extra work done. I had to sit with my wife and I said, look, I know it's been a grind and I know I work a lot and I know I work a lot of hours. I got to tell you next year is going to be worse. And she was like, what? And I'm like, I, I, it's going to be bad. I'm like, but I promise you, I have a plan that's going to get us out the backside of this to be in a place where we're in control. We get to do what we want. And I'm going to build this company and I'll figure it out. I'm working on it. And, and now, you know, it's amazing. It, it's, it's all the things I wanted it to be. And for all the reasons I wanted it to be, which I think is more important. Well, and then you're helping people through, I mean, someone that's passionate about running their own business is going to be a better, like they're just going to make better things, right? You're just going to have your clients are better because you are enjoying what you're doing and you are serving your own purpose. And so it kind of trickles throughout everything that you're doing. And you're not there because you have to be there, right? Like that is amazing difference of when you're there because you chose to be there and both ways, right? Like they're not like, Oh, I don't know. I got to, yeah, I have to do all the paperwork to fire this guy. Like, no, like we are, we're in this together. And if it's beneficial to each other, let's go and let's win together. But if it's not working, that's okay too. Like there's no hard feelings. So I like to wrap up these calls with a question. And I think what I think would, would be super helpful for anyone listening, especially if they're like in this place where they're trying to 
determine if they're going the traditional route or they want to lean into their passions hardcore. Do you have any like advice that you would tell like someone like you as you were thinking about going into the police academy or DJing, anything like that you could share? The world has changed from when I was a 19 year old kid. Everything is at your fingertips now. The things that make you happy, there's no reason you can't do that at night when you get home. There's no reason you don't have to change your full-time job to express your creativity, right? I, I, I was DJing on weekends because I enjoyed it, right? And then I was DJing on weekends because it was helping me fulfill a, a goal that I had made in my own mind, right? And I didn't have to change my full-time job. I still stayed on track there. I still did all the things. I, I often tell people to give back Tuesday nights. So if you have a goal you're trying to achieve, give back Tuesday nights. Matt, when was the last time you told a story? You're like, there was this amazing Tuesday night where we all went out. Never. Had a good night on Monday Night Football, right? Thirsty Thursday. We can go through all the days. It's never Tuesday. So you give back Tuesday night, right? And you say, I'm going to dedicate a minimum of one hour a week to me. Tuesday nights. I'm going to give myself from 8 to 9 o'clock and I'm going to learn a new skill or I'm going to paint or I'm going to mix music or I'm going to write or I'm going to go for a run, whatever it is, things that are going to help you get to whatever that goal is. So if you said, I'm trying to figure out what I should do, but I've got this job. It's in corporate America. Great. On Tuesday nights from eight to nine, I had this young girl and she was trying to figure it out and, and she wanted to really get really good at Photoshop. I said, okay. So well, in the next eight weeks, I, I, I taught myself video editing, all these things on YouTube tutorials. I was like, so go home on Tuesday nights and do YouTube tutorials on Photoshop. And in the next eight to 12 weeks, you're going to have a skill set that you're proud of. And then you could actually then apply. If you really enjoy it, you could really dive into it. But in 12 weeks, I promise you in 12 weeks, if you go out on Tuesday nights or you watch a TV show on Tuesday nights, give it back to yourself. And I promise you. So I did Tuesday nights is when I worked on all my stuff. Tuesday nights is when I wrote my book. Tuesday night, like Tuesday nights, you just focus and you go because that's what it's all about for you. And having that set time on your calendar that's only for you, it's a, that's purposeful. No, I, lo- I give back Tuesday nights. <laughs> I mean, you can have your Taco Tuesday and then you can do your eight to nine. Eight to nine. And sometimes it, you'll wake up, you'll be looking at the clock and it'll be 11 on a Tuesday night because you're like, oh man. And if you find that thing that you're passionate about, you're like, oh, this, I want to do this every day. This is amazing. And so it allows you to try it with no risk, no risk. This thing right here, you can do anything like what we would have given when we were that age to have that opportunity. But here's the thing. It doesn't have to be that age. You could be 65 right now and saying, God, I wish I was a video editor when I was a kid, you know, like, okay, go be a video editor, like download a program and let's go. (laughs) Everything's at our fingertips. Well, I appreciate you sharing your story. I think it's so inspiring to to just hear like your path and 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 the things that you've accomplished and even though you hit this like top level that I think a lot of people would be like good, this is this, you know, <laughs> and then you decided, no, I'm going to do my own thing and start this company where you're changing lives for other people while also enjoying the heck out of it. It's pretty amazing. It's a, it's a, it's been an amazing ride. I appreciate you having me on. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I was introduced to you and I love the, the work that you're doing. And I love that you found your thing, right? Like the, you, you, you know, when, when you read about this whole journey for you is like, you know, when you find it, you, you can talk to that, you find it and you're like, wait, you know what? This, this isn't just sitting in a room for an hour talking to somebody. There's a lot of work on the back end of this. There's a lot of work to put this together. All the, all the paperwork, all the stuff that you send in advance, like there's a lot of work. It's really well done. But it's a passion. You're like, you know what? I'm going to dedicate the time to that because it's that important to me. 100%. I agree with you. This 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 podcast is, yeah, it's a lot of work. But it it is the first thing in my life that has fulfilled me in a way that no other project has. So, you know, I agree. that Give back Tuesday nights. In my case, give back Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, <laughs> Friday nights. Whatever. That's, that's what it turns be. into, though. That's okay. Exactly. It's great. You don't hate it. No. So, no. It's awesome. Thanks, thank Matt. Thank you. Thanks for being a part of this. And for those of you listening, if you're enjoying the podcast, please uh, rate and review. That's super helpful. If for nothing else, it gives me fuel to keep going. So thank you, Wayne, for being here. And uh, we'll see you next week.
For more information, please visit www.thelifeshiftpodcast.com.